I'm sorry to uh, ask people again to you know cut off conversations. I, I I didn't mean to have a conversation stopper after that. Michi and I have two jobs to do, one of which is to talk about nonprofits law, uh, and the other one of which is to thank everybody and close up. And I wanted all of that to happen by 5 o'clock, so we have a little fast teaching uh, to do. Um, the, the, the point of leaving nonprofits organization law subjects to the end of the day was not for everybody to leave or for us to put everybody to sleep. So I thought, let's demonstrate Freedom Box and then everybody will stay awake for at least two minutes while we talk about nonprofits organizations. Um, let's, uh, let's go and see how long we can keep them awake. <laughs> well, you've seen some of our clients uh, in the morning. Uh, the Apache Software Foundation, software in the public interest from the audience. There are existing ways to apply the fiscal sponsorship to existing nonprofit uh, FOSS projects, basically SFLC's primary client base. Some of those, those organizations, like the Free Software Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, SPI, are freestanding 501c3s manufactured at a time when there were very few such entities and the IRS, that's the Internal Revenue Service, did not treat them with any special scrutiny or consideration. They came into existence with missions that said that they were going to make and distribute free and open source software, and the service gave them positive determinations, and they have adequate public support, and they're essentially protected by grandfathering against any changes in the climate. When SFLC came into existence in 2005, that was still fundamentally the way it all worked. And we were able to determine successfully not only ourselves as a New York nonprofit educational and legal services corporation, but also as a 501c3 tax exempt organization, which was, we were relatively easily able to get also for other clients of ours the determinations as 501c3s in short periods of time at a relatively low cost to ourselves. This changed noticeably in the period of the first Obama administration, when, as it happens, other entities seeking to become 501c3 entities determined tax-exempt organizations also had difficulties. You remember that the United States uh, Internal Revenue Service became the kicking object of the right wing of the Republican Party because the exempt organizations division of the IRS was using keyword searching to discover organization applications that deserved high scrutiny. The words Tea Party turned up as among the search terms, thus causing what may yet turn out to be the impeachment of the IRS commissioner in the that shit crazy Republican House of Representatives. Uh, but as the New York Times reported in its coverage uh, on the exempt organization's firestorm, among the other keywords that were being searched for the, by the IRS for extensive uh, review uh, were the words open source and free software. And so we too found ourselves inside the more stringent and ultimately negative form of IRS review that the right wing of the Republican Party was also complaining about. The consequence was that beginning more than five years ago, it became very difficult for us to secure these reliable determinations. They didn't really seize, but it became much more difficult. And in our conversations with the service in the course of our representation of our clients, we came to understand that the service once it had formed a task force to consider this subject, also came to the conclusion that software making, even software making under free and open source software licenses for the general public was not a charitable activity for which 501c3 determination was appropriate. We were accustomed to receiving questions from the service on applications for our clients of the kind, well, what if your software fell into the hands of terrorists? 
or other extremely informative questions asked by the service in the course of reviewing our applications. But what became clear, as Mishy says, was that the service had come to an analytical conclusion that the act of making software itself for general consumption by everybody was no longer a charitable use. And in connection with our clients' applications, the service began to say things like, well, if your software was only usable by by disabled persons or underprivileged people, then that would be one thing. But you allow everybody to use this software, and you allow them to use it in their businesses and make a profit with it. And how can that be a charitable use? So we started to put our heads together about how to deal with this. This had not completely stopped. We kept talking to the services. But some of our other colleagues in this area also started doing things. You, one of the things which happened was the formation of a working group in which some of the people in this room and some of them outside have been closely engaged to work on the problem. Last year at our 10th anniversary conference, you heard some of these organizations talk about fiscal sponsorship arrangements or their plans to come up with solutions to address this particular problem. We had made Software Freedom Conservancy at SFLC for the purpose of providing fiscal administration and support services to our own clients, an asset manager, if you like, of a nonprofit client kind for our clients to use. And we also knew that if we built such an organization, it would have capacity that could also be put at the service of other nonprofits that were not our clients. And so the conservancy was originally designed to provide for our clients the technical and fiscal administrative services that they would need and to allow other projects to apply for the same kinds of treatment. Once SFLC and the Software Freedom Conservancy went separate ways in 2010, the architecture that we had chosen for the conservancy became the architecture of a freestanding fiscal sponsorship organization. The rule, for example, that you will find in connection with the Conservancy's processes as documented in the reading materials, that any project which is sponsored by the Conservancy can have no other fiscal sponsor was an architectural limitation that made sense to us when we were crafting for our own clients. We were, after all, trying to hold the clients safely in a confidential administrative structure that we controlled. And the rule, which also had some role from IRS guidance, that everybody had to be exclusively connected in a unique relationship, one sponsor which acts on your behalf in its discretion, and which made architectural sense for us when we were like two, pair, like two blades of a pair of scissors, began to seem to me a, an unnecessary architectural restriction in the next round. Without the conservancy, SFLC needed a new asset manager of its own. And we began to think about ways that we might attempt a broader and more flexible architecture. But we also had to encounter the fact that the IRS was a much more difficult territory for us with respect to any form of FOSS nonprofit being successfully determined through the 501c3 process by IRS. So two things happened. One, of course, there were these existing organizations which were either the umbrella organizations or acted as fiscal sponsorship organizations. The pressure on these organizations increased. There were projects as large as Debian who have actually found it to be useful to be associated with, for example, software in the public interest and not chosen to come up with one, cho to one national organization. So we, try, we, we tried advising and we advised a lot of our clients to choose one of these existing organizations where their needs could be met by either being uh, under an umbrella organization or having a fiscal sponsorship arrangement with these organizations. On the other side, when it also became necessary for us, for our other clients, One Conservancy was another independent organization, to come up with a structure which could provide similar services. But also this time we had learned a different architectural lesson. 
So we tried to figure out what is it that we can do, and we remodeled and repurposed certain of these fiscal sponsorship arrangements. And one of the things which we experimented with was something called collaboration agreements. So you create entities which actually collaborate with other projects. The advantage being that the project does not lose its identity, and this is a non-exclusive arrangement, which means that Project A, if has a relationship with entity collaboration, which, is, which it's collaborating with entity B, it can actually have many different multiple collaboration agreements with entity C, D, E, whatever serves its purpose. So let's just look at the details of that for a moment. The service is now being asked to approve an application for tax deductibility in the 501c3 determination process for an applicant whose job as a nonprofit is to provide technical, administrative, and support services to other nonprofits. Its task is to collaborate with nonprofits to provide them technical and administrative assistance services. This is actually a relatively well trodden path in the IRS's traditional understanding of what nonprofits may do. The service allows, indeed encourages, the formation of nonprofits which provide technical assistance services to other nonprofits. And in the various service actions over the years, one can see that among the services uh, uh, that the service encourages nonprofits to collaborate in providing with to others include such matters as financial administration, bookkeeping, fundraising, expenditure control, IT, and many other similar relevant services. So, so if you're a free software project who does not like talking about taxes, or does not want to deal with paperwork, or have other things taken care of, there are these organizations with whom you can collaborate for fundraising activities, to get support for your taxes, to get some other administrative support. With, and there are multiple of these entities, and it's now possible to create them. There is one entity which actually already exists at SFLC, and that is called the Free Software Support Network. It already has collaboration agreements with some of these big projects you know about, and is working just very smoothly for them, where the project contributors are able to devote their time to the activities they think are fun, for example, making software, and do not want all the other boring parts of dealing with the paperwork, which is what the entity takes care of that. And the advantage also is that such an entity is housed at SFLC. So their lawyers are there to represent them, and there is Free Software Support Network also to take care of the administrative aspects of their project management. We made FSSN by repurposing an existing 501c3 during the period in which at the IRS was most hostile. And we used FSSN to pioneer the structures of collaboration agreements and other, tra and other transactional materials that we would need in the process of implementing the new architecture. Then we began to try experiments on the service by creating and shepherding through the determination process entities specifically defined at the time of their application as collaboration technical assistance entities for nonprofits. As we were doing this, the service responding to the enormous political difficulties of its exempt organizations division began to make positive changes of its own. Two of the important changes which the service has made, and they can be found under their 2015 publication 557, are a change in the appeals process. So the exempt organization group earlier only had one appeal process, so there was just a technical conference you could get with such a group, but now there's an appeal as well as a technical conference you can get. The other thing which service did was the introduction of another form called Form 1023. EZ. So those of the organizations who uh, seek to get tax exempt status under 501c3 of the code file a 1023 application. What they did was they streamlined this application for recognition of exemption and introduced a shorter form, which is now called Form 23, 1023EZ. It's a three-page form, 
although there is a questionnaire, of course, it can be filed electronically. It's $400 user fee, which you have to pay online, and poof, you go. And you can answer a questionnaire, and once the answer to all those questions have to be no, and <laughs> if that is true, then you can be a tax-exempt organization. The, ten, is, sorry. Uh, the 1023 EC, therefore, is essentially a faster path towards the very thing the service was slowing down before it ran into political trouble. And we have new additional procedural safeguards in the event that the exempt organizations division denies the applications. The 1023 EZ process is designed for comparatively small scale exempt organizations from the services point of view. An organization may use the 1023 EZ to seek an exemption determination if it has assets under a quarter million dollars and gross receipts under $50,000 a year. Oddly enough, the activity of most free software projects that are among our clients fits inside those limits pretty much all the time. We are not, as you understand, great burners of money to make software in the free software world. And as we have pointed out, our transactional arrangements are designed to allow a project to be supported by multiple such collaboration organizations. The result is that the 1023 EZ process gives us a fast path to the creation of large numbers of sponsorship or rather collaboration organizations which we can use to surround free software projects in the period of their growth on whatever trajectory they may have. Do they want a, a corporate form and state legal entity existence. We can bring up a Delaware nonprofit corporation in 48 hours. We can bring up corporations in other parts of the United States on slightly longer time scales. We do not need that organization to become a 501c3 and file tax returns every year and meet local charities, regulation standards for larger weight nonprofits. We can leave it in an unaffiliated form like Debian or in a national uh, state law nonprofit form and provide tax deductibility to its contributors through the collaboration entity or entities with which it is associated. Our experiments over the last year have shown that we can use that process reliably now to create new collaboration entities in a short period of time, double digit weeks, as Garby would say, rather than the months or years that we were suffering at the exempt organizations division during the period of the drought. So based on what your requirement is, there could be that you really want to be a nonprofit yourself, but be mindful of what that entails. And you can discuss that, and based on that, we could, of course, advise you. Sometimes you, it's much better to become an affiliated project with the existing umbrella organizations or have a fiscal sponsorship arrangements, but we advise you to talk carefully, understand what is it that you are gaining and what is it that you are losing, what does, how does that impact your own, uh, or own structure, entity, or you come up with arrangements like collaboration agreements which offer you enough flexibility where there is, there is definitely some small administrative charge, there is a written agreement, but you still get all the advantages of a 501c3, but without the burdens. Or you want to use another process of becoming a full-fledged 501c3 organization where it is better to first see whether it would be possible or what the service is looking at. But so what we would report, I think, and, and I admit that I'm rushing us so that people can enjoy their Friday evening at some point soon. What, what, I, what, what I think we can report on the basis of the work we've done is that the drought is over. We do understand how to get from the service determinations swiftly and relatively certainly that we need. And we have gained flexibility in the architecture which, as legal engineers, we can use to support free software projects as they grow from nothing to everything. 
uh, and we can afford them a lot of options about how they do that. We are also able to create organizations flexibly enough that we can create much better risk tolerance in our overall ecosystem if any one organization should fail or falter or run into particular difficulties that are idiosyncratic to itself. This is not to say that we know everything about this process yet. The 1023EZ is new to the service. The political environment around the service is clearly still changing. I do not suppose that Paul Ryan has nothing to say about how he wants all this to work. Um, we know that there are technical issues that we can't yet resolve until we have gained more experience. What happens when a 1023 collaboration organization exceeds $50,000 in gross annual income in an unplanned and not overwhelming amount. What happens after the conditional exemption determination granted under the 1023EZ comes up for permanent review inside the EOD? We don't yet know enough to be able to tell you that we see everything clearly about this, but we know that we have much blue sky before us and that we have a much more favorable territory. And we think that the work that we have done in designing and experimenting with these arrangements will ultimately pay off in a very flexible, very durable, very strong form of relationship between free software organizations and the tax exemption and tax deductibility uh, situation in the United States. Well, hopefully we will have more positive news next year. Question. Yes, Shane. So I don't have a question for you guys other than good, good job. Uh, a piece of advice for everybody else that I think uh, the majority of the board at the Apache Software Foundation would echo is if you do have a project or even just a personal idea and you're thinking you'd like to do your own 501c3 and you want to do your own thing, don't. Start here. Uh, start with SPI, start with Apache, go to an umbrella organization first because the overhead of not just doing the paperwork, but thinking through the actual legal aspects of having a board. So I'm a director of the foundation. I'm protected by the DNO insurance, but setting up the. Uh, oh, you have DNO insurance. Yes, we do. Oh no, no, I <laughs> check that every year. That. We tend to ask that question. Yes. We so, also like to see the premium check. If we so can. that's a thing that you have to answer. It's not worth your hassle if you're at a smaller point. This is a perfect example of a really, really easy way to do it with a little bit of support. Apache has a lot of support. SPI has some support. Go with somebody who already has one. Yeah, we, we, we wouldn't disagree with that in any way at all. We don't recommend to people that they begin by assuming they need a 501c3 for their project all by itself. I think what we are saying is that indeed we expect that it will be possible to avoid path dependency in that decision all the way along. We've had clients who became 501c3s because they thought they needed to later. Sometimes that didn't work out very well for them. Sometimes early life cycle decisions in a project turned out to constrain decisions inside that project for years to come. We think it will be possible to say, well, you might want to do it the Apache way or the SPI way or the Software Freedom Conservancy way, but you also might find flexibility and desirability in working with collaboration organizations for a while and see how it helps you. We have clients with fairly sophisticated organizational lives. Um, uh, and, and, and those organizations, which are more than capable of setting up nonprofits in more than one country and opening bank accounts around the world, have nonetheless found it useful to engage in collaborations with the Free Software Support Network or other entities of our creation, because even for highly organized and sophisticated entities, these structures may have some particular utility. 